Hi, this is going to just be a short video about solenoids. This is a solenoid assembly out of a Newtone K model door, long tube door chime. And K model chimes were manufactured probably sometime right after the end of World War II, say around 1947 or so and were in production and available pretty much all the way through the end of the late 1950s. By the time you get to the early 1960s, they had moved on to the L model chimes and things changed quite a bit at that point. So these are the K model chimes. I've done other videos on K model chime base servicing and rebuilding and those kind of things, which I'm sure some of you have watched. And we're working on a, on a sort of a side project with these right now. And I need to sort of care characterize this and also having repaired a lot more K model chimes over the last year I thought I'd share some of the things that I've learned about them that have to do with the solenoids. Let's look at the basic parts of the solenoid assembly. You have the metal frame and it's just four pieces of steel I think. I don't think they're mag are they magnetic. Let's see. Yes they are. So you have a steel frame, it's four pieces, and it's held together with little bent over tabs on the top and the bottom, and rightfully so, it's stamped in the end, do not oil, because you're not supposed to oil these. And if you've watched any of my videos about servicing chimes like this, you already know what to use, and the proper thing to clean the solenoid bores out is lighter fluid, uh, Ronson lighter fluid, like you use in your Zippo lighter, or your dad or your granddad used. So it's a, it's a metal frame frame. Inside the metal frame you have the coil. This is the electromagnetic coil and it's it's wound around the the brass tube that's in the center and then when it was when they were finished winding it it has this adhesive tape over it to protect the windings. Electromagnetic coils are made out of magnet wire and magnet wire is surprisingly enough, used to make magnets like electromagnets. Remember in elementary school you had electromagnets and bar magnets and iron filings and great fun there. The magnet wire in most of these as far as I can tell, here you can sort of see the little end of it stick out of the cloth cover. This is about a 30 gauge magnet wire and magnet wire is copper wire However, it's copper wire that has an enamel or lacquer coating over the outside of it, and that's what and the and the coating is the insulator. It's the same idea as wire that has a plastic cover on it. So we have a red insulator and a black insulator for that. But here you couldn't have the plastic insulator because the coil would become too bulky and it would be too large. So the enamel or lacquer coating is what insulates it. Otherwise, when you wound it around and put a current through it, it would short out and it wouldn't be a magnet. So that's the coil. And then, like I said, in the center of the coil, you have the brass tube. And on the front of it, this is the front of the, of the solenoid assembly or the tube assembly, you have this brass cap. And there's a hole in the brass cap because that's where the striker pops out to hit the chime tube. And on the back you have a rubber cap to cap it off. Now most of you if you're dealing with an old chime like this your caps are a little bit shorter than this one. They're about half the length. This is a new modern replacement cap because what happens to the caps are whatever kind of material they were made out of. I think they were some kind of rubber material. They get hard and fall apart and turn into little blocks of tar and they don't really do the job very well. So these are actually modern caps that we have in stock now. And while they're not specifically designed for solenoid assemblies in chimes, they do fit properly. They serve the purpose, which is to keep everything from falling out of the end of the solenoid. And they do have to be modified slightly because they fit very tightly. And if you look at the original ones, in the very end right here, there's a little hole in it. So we have a punch that we use to make a hole because if you don't have a hole, then it creates suction and, the, and it won't pop out properly. So the hole is important. So we'll take that off put that aside and then we'll go ahead and take this apart so if we tip it out 
tip it out. Doesn't want to come out. Let's push it out through the front. We have the the plunger with the plastic tip on it. This one happens to be red. The tips vary in color a lot. I've seen red ones, I've seen white ones, I've seen blue ones, I've seen black ones. There doesn't seem to be a lot of rhyme or reason to the color of it. Red's probably the most popular or most common and like that. So we'll put that aside for a second. And then also inside is the single most lost part of all of these, which I'm going to put it on the screwdriver here so you can see it, or maybe that's not the best way to do it. How about this way? If we put it like this. It's the spring. And the spring is part of our special project, but there'll be uh, videos about that in the near future. So let's go ahead and put the spring aside. As I show in the other videos, the best way to deal with small parts like this is we're going to put it in a little cup here so we don't lose it. The spring is the most lost part because surprisingly enough it can bounce off the workbench and fly across your garage or workshop floor and you'll never find it again. It seems like they're small, they're very thin, and they bounce a lot. So I'm pretty sure that most of them when they bounce and go missing they end up somewhere in Cleveland, but that's just what I think. Anyway, so the solenoid Fortunately, the solenoid assembly itself, the coil and the frame and the brass tube, these don't generally present much of a problem. I've only ever seen one where the electromagnetic coil was burnt up, and I'm sure that had something to do with someone putting totally the wrong kind of voltage into the chime instead of the 20 volts that it was designed for. I'm thinking probably it was more like 110. So if you don't do something like that, the coil should last forever. The resistance on the coil, if you want to check yours nominally, nominally means on an average, it should read somewhere around 24, 25 ohms. And you can measure that by measuring on the ends of the little magnet wires where they come out of the cloth covering. Uh, to get an accurate reading, you need to either take out some really, really fine sandpaper and just sand the end of it so you have clean copper. Or what I did for when I did this one was I just heated it up with a soldering iron and put a little dab of solder because the flux in the solder will clean the copper and burn off the enamel and the solder sticks and then you can get a decent reading. I've done lots of videos already that shows how you clean the inside of the tubes to take out all the gunk and residue that builds up after 50 or 60 years. And that's not what I'm going to do here. The other thing is with these caps and these are some of the things that we that I've learned over the last year in doing more and more of these K model chimes. So one of the problems with these caps is they're a press fit. So there's the front of the tube and you can see how the front of the tube is short and the back of the tube is long and the cap is about the same almost the same length as the tube where it comes out through the frame. One of the things that happens to these caps, which I see a lot of, and I think this one has the beginning of it probably. Let's see. See if we can get a close-up on that. If you look really, really carefully right here, and it's hard for me to see while I'm showing you, there's the beginning of a crack in the cap that starts here at the back edge and then it's going to run down the length of the cap till it gets near where it's folded over at the front. I would say probably on an average, there you can see it, it's right there, right in the center of the cap at the high point where it's kind of shiny from the light reflection. I would say probably 60-70% of the caps that I, on the chimes that I've worked on, they have cracks in them. And the problem with that is when you go to put this back on the end, or if you didn't, even if you didn't take it off, it doesn't press on very tightly. It sort of just slides on easily. And that's not really good because every time the solenoid is energized, the plunger shoots out to hit the tube and the spring compresses up in the front end of the tube and then the the rod pushes against it it kind of hammers against the inside of the cap and when it has a crack in it 
and it doesn't fit tightly, the cap very slowly inches its way off. This one actually fits pretty well. It stays on pretty strongly. But it becomes pushed out. And I've actually had a couple of these when I'm working on them that we ran the chine without any tubes in place because I was checking something. I don't remember what exactly. And as the as the plunger popped out and it hit the inside of the cap, the cap actually flew off and went across the room on the floor. And then we had to find it and that wasn't any fun. So the caps being loose is a problem because the other thing that happens is the, the cap is the stop for the whole thing. It prevents it from going too far. So it alters how the chime works and all of that's a problem. So what we've been doing lately and no, I haven't found caps like this anywhere to buy. I don't know whether they were specially made or whether it was some common part that came from something else that you could readily buy back in the 50s. Still working on it, but don't know for sure. So you don't want to do anything dramatic or drastic because there may be a day where you need to take the cap off and you certainly don't want to do something silly like try to solder it onto the tube or use some kind of epoxy or some huge overbearing measure to help hold it on. What you need is to just give it a little bit of help and no sort of squeezing it out of round and then pushing it on. That, none of that works. So what we've come up with which seems to work pretty well and time will tell of course. I wish they were all as tight as this one. We put them on to, and we make sure that everything works properly and when they're pushed on all the way, there's a little tiny space right here where the, where the back end of the cap doesn't quite sit against the metal frame. And what we've been doing is on the top, so if it were sitting like this, this is the right orientation, we put one small drop small drop one small drop not flood it put a whole ton because you get yourself in trouble one of the very smallest drops that you possibly can place right at the top between the back end of the cap and the tube of super glue and then you let it dry for at least 24 hours if you do it too soon it's not going to do you any good it has to actually set up and the super glue is thin enough that I think it wicks underneath the cap just a little. In our testing, we've actually taken them off, and yes, you can actually take them off if you need to, but you'll need a tool to take them off, not just your finger. But it provides just the littlest bit of extra grip, and the caps don't tend to want to fall off. Sorry, you can't see that. So again, if you put too much and you get it all the way around and you think, oh, I'm going to glue that thing on, it'll never come off and all that. While that very well may be true, it may not ever come off again. The day may come when you need to take it off and then you've totally blown the whole thing. One small, the smallest pot drop humanly possible of super glue. Okay, so that's one thing we've learned. The other thing we've learned is about the strikers. So the strikers, it's actually a pretty simple little thing. It's a round metal rod. It, the ends are chamfered somewhat, and I'll show you what that's about. So the back end's chamfered a little bit. On some of them, the front edge is chamfered a little bit also, and I think that's to allow it to slide through the tube more easily, perhaps. And then on the end, you have the plastic tip, which I'm going to take out. And so in the very end of it, there's a hole. And that's, of course, where the tip fits. So the hole has a depth of about 12 millimeters. And the little plastic tips fit into the hole. Now, let's go to the whiteboard because it'll be easier to understand. All right, so here's our mega size plunger assembly. This is this, only it's jumbo size. It's for the world's biggest long tube eight note chime ever. Anyway, so here's our metal rod and here's the hole at the front edge, our front end, and the blue is the striker, the tip, plastic tip, 
And the chamfered ends are these little ant corners here. You have to remember this is a, it's round, it's a rod. And they're sort of chamfered off at a slight angle. And I think that allows it to slide back and forth in the tube more easily than if you had a squared off edge. And they're not all like that, but a lot of them are. So it's hard to say. There's not a lot of consistency sometimes from chime to chime. It seems like there's a certain amount of variation. Probably has to do with when it was actually made. Here's our hole here in the end of the rod. And the hole actually measures the depth of the hole from the front to the end here is 12 millimeters. And that's pretty consistent. And the tip, on an average, and one of the things about the little plastic tips, the little red ones, are a lot of them, when we get the chimes in, they're worn down a lot. Sometimes the ends are actually kind of chipped and broken off. And so it's hard to get an exact measurement on how long they probably were when they were brand new. So our very best guess is the length of the plastic rod is around 14 and a half millimeters. And in so in, and inside, oh, and sorry, the last bit is the amount that it actually sticks out beyond the end of the metal rod, on an average, with testing and trying to see which, what works the best, it should extend out somewhere in the neighborhood of seven and a half millimeters. Is about right. And that gives you enough, when it pops out of the solenoid tube, it gives it enough length that it can hit the brass tube solidly and it's not just brushing up against it. One of the things that we've figured out is Inside the hole, it seems as if part of it is slightly threaded inside. And a lot of these, to take them apart, to take the tips out of the, out of the plungers, if you hold the plunger or hold the tip and turn the plunger, they unscrew and come apart. Now, whether they were threaded intentionally or it's some byproduct of making the hole in the end of it, I don't really know. But it seems as if there's enough of them are like that, that it probably maybe was done on purpose. But one of the things that we notice is, and this one is a good example, that's why I picked it, there's a problem with what happens to all of this when it gets old. The plastic that makes up the tip gets hard and brittle, I think. Harder probably now than it was when it was brand new. And because it gets hard, it doesn't want to stay in place if it is threaded into the threads inside the tube. It becomes loose like this one is. This one's loose. So I can just grab this and without turning it, I can just pull it out. Well, likewise, if I just push it in a little bit and push down on it with my finger, I can push it back down in, and now we only have a little bit sticking out. So what happens is, as these get older and they've rung, I don't know, four million times, every time it hits the tube, it hammers on the pin. And over time, if it is threaded, it strips out the threads on the plastic rod, and eventually it gets pushed inside like that and they become way too short. This is probably half of what it should be and so when it pops out of the solenoid to hit the tube it never actually touches the tube because it's too short. And then also to complicate that sometimes the tip is broken off and that makes it even shorter still. Uh, we've had many of these that you get it all set up and it seems perfect and they ring, it rings almost perfectly the first time and after that only two of the notes ring because the tips have all gotten pushed in on the other two notes. So this is a problem. And a lot of this we're just trying to reason through because there is basically no one to ask that was there when this stuff was new anymore and we have to figure out what to do. The problem is that you have all of this free space in the, in the hole 
behind the tip. And if the threaded portion of the plastic tip is worn, then the force of hitting the two pushes the whole tip assembly back into the void here, and then it becomes too short. And that's not good. So what we've done up until now, and we're gonna to continue to do it for a little while, unless it's really, really, really bad, we take it and we put we take the tip out of the of the plunger and we mix up a little two-part epoxy, the kind that sets in like five minutes, and you use a small toothpick and you put the epoxy down inside the hole and a little bit on the tip and then you insert it back into the end and you measure it to make sure you have your approximately seven and a half millimeters and then when you get them all the same and they all have to be the same that's one of the key things on this you have four plungers with four tips for four tubes they all have to be as close to the same as humanly possible otherwise when the chime rings it doesn't sound right so once you get all four of them done and they're all the same then you set them aside and you let the epoxy dry for at least 24 hours now you have to be careful because you don't want to get epoxy all over the metal plunger and if you do you have to use a razor blade and carefully scrape it off because this has to be cleaned and in the other videos I show you how to clean these so there's no excuses and you leave it alone let it dry overnight at least 24 hours because if you don't let it dry long enough and you try it and it hits the tube and it hammers the tip back into the plunger you got a problem because you might not be able to get it out so that's bad so one of the things that we're going to be doing that we're working on now is we're sourcing plastic rod material that's the same size as the original ones and of course it'll come in long lengths so we'll have to cut it and then we'll have to shape the tips because they're supposed to be they're supposed to be sort of slightly pointed on the end so the whole thing isn't hitting it it's sort of tapered and when we and we're going to start making replacement tips and when we make when we make the replacement tips instead of doing it this way how it possibly was done originally which is it's about 14 and a half millimeters long and it threads into the threads inside the hole in the plunger we're going to make them the length of the plunger so we're going to have we're going to make them all together about 19 and a half millimeters long and that way the back of the tip will sit in the back of the hole and then to ensure that they're all the same length we'll probably make them a little longer maybe 20 millimeters we'll assemble a set of four and then we'll very carefully make sure they're all the same final length by by sanding off or shaping the end somehow which we haven't figured out how we're going to do that yet so that's one of the things that happens this all came up recently because I had a reasonably local person watch one of my videos and he had a K model chime and he followed the servicing video and he did everything that I said and he did a pretty good job on it then he called me up and he said well now it actually works but it doesn't have any volume there's it's not loud enough and he had the vo volume adjustment set up all the way and all that and he didn't really know what to do and I asked him about whether the tips were st and he didn't know whether he it, it's too obscure and that's why I decided to make this video because it's a pretty obscure thing unless you do a lot of these you don't know how this is supposed to be so he decided that it would be easier he just sent it to me and indeed all three of the four tips were all really short and pushed back in like that and when they would shoot out of the solenoids they would barely graze the tube it just barely touched it and that was with the tube moved all the way back in the closest it could be on the hanger which isn't really where it's supposed to be and all of that so we took out the tips we glued them all back in place we did some other general service on it some things that he didn't do and when we got done it all worked really really well so that's that, those are some of the more fine details of working on a new tone K model chime if you're trying to get your chime to work properly again. I know this is a lot of like really fine detail stuff here, but 
it turns out doorbells are all about the fine details. Uh, there's a lot of engineering and there's a lot of design that went into these and you can't just gloss over it. If you really want it to work like it did when it was new, you've got to understand all of the fine points and that's why we're making the videos about them. So that's what we've learned so far. We do have a, a project. We're working on more projects to deal with the K model chimes because they are very popular and there'll be more videos about that in the near future, I'm pretty sure. But uh, for today, that's all. So I hope you found this interesting and I hope you might find it helpful. If you do, please give it a big thumbs up on YouTube. If you would subscribe, I would appreciate it. You can click on the subscribe panel at the top of our YouTube channel. If you click on the little bell on the subscribe channel and put your email address in, you'll get an email notification when we post a new video. And we appreciate you doing that. That's all for today. See you on the next video.